odd for the singular privilege he gave to a very unworthy and very weak and very base and very despised man to come to this lovely country. I have been invited a number of times to America and to other countries, many, most all of which we did not believe was God's will. We had to sort out many times what to say yes to. And, but this particular invitation that came, we, my wife and I, together, praying, realized God was confirming that we should come. And after what I heard of this very godly man and the good work he's doing, and I do know that the dear Lord in mercy allowed me to come to stand alongside of a soul, a life poured out has built up a great work and God has honored him and I do believe God will do something wonderful through these meetings for America in the years that lie ahead but thank you for allowing this South African man to come to your lovely country I am not offended at the way you shout hallelujah <laughs> I am reserved, I must admit. But I know you love Christ and I acknowledge that I am unworthy to be ministering to such a godly group. I am so conscious of it. But thank you for inviting me. Dear Lord, in mercy on all of us, come in this meeting tonight. Thank you for these dear souls that I have come to love. Everyone I've conversed with and looked in their eyes and seen their tears and the brokenness and the tenderness. And dear man, I walked with along the hill this afternoon and he sobbed and sobbed and sobbed and couldn't speak. That's all I really know of him, Lord. Thank you. Thank you for the people who would break before their God and seek their God in desperation in this wicked world to be holy, to be revived. Come, Lord, to this precious, precious, precious group whom Thou hast brought from many corners of this land, aside, away from that terrible atmosphere out there. It's unbelievable. And I thank You, Lord, that we know Thou didst ordain this convention and that we are here by God taking us aside, that we where the apple of God's eye, each one of us, can go back there and live a Christ-like, holy life, no matter what the world does. Come now in these moments and speak further to all of our bowed hearts and our broken hearts. In Jesus Christ's name. In Jesus Christ's name. Amen. You need not look up these verses. You know them off by heart. Galatians 6.14 But God forbid that I should glory save in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. By whom, by whom, by whom the world is crucified unto me. God forbid that I should glory save in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ by whom the world is crucified unto me and I unto the world. 1 John 2 verse 15 Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world passeth away, and the lust thereof. But whoso doeth the will of God abideth forever. Love not the world neither the things that are in the world. 
If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. James 4 verse 4. Know ye not that the friendship of the world is enmity with God? Whosoever therefore will be a friend of the world is the enemy of God. God forbid that I should glory save in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ by whom the world is crucified unto me, and I unto the world. The first meeting we gathered here, I shared briefly of the godly Scottish man, Presbyterian minister, who was serving God in his last days in our hometown, back in South Africa. And how he said to me, before he led me to Christ, Keith, written across your life, boy, if you're going to be truly saved, as I know salvation, written across your life, boy, will be these words that every single person in the world will see written boldly across your life. Finished with the world. By the way you dress. By the way you speak. By the company you keep. By the places you go. And frequent. And Keith, if those words are not written across you, where I come from in Scotland, you're not saved. There's no such a thing as a worldly Christian. If you're worldly, you're not a Christian. Is the world crucified unto you? Will you answer God, please, sir? God's all that matters here. Will you, everyone, just answer God now? God alone in your hearts. Otherwise, what on earth are you doing here, sir? If it isn't only God that matters, what are you doing here? Will you answer God, please, sincerely? Is the world crucified unto you? Are you crucified unto the world? Or is the world still in your heart? Is the world still in your heart? A man by the name of Ben Pina, one of the godliest men I ever knew, Afrikaans-speaking missionary back in South Africa, headed one of the great missions of our country for many, many years, the leader. Great influence in South Africa. He told me how when he was a young missionary, driving across South Africa in the heat of the Karoo, which is the most extremely hot place of our country, extreme heat, he was driving with his little children. His children were small those days. Children in the back, his wife beside him, they're driving in his old car. No air conditioning in those days. And there they drove, hour upon hour upon hour upon hour, in the extreme heat, bathing him. He looked back, he saw the children were agitated, but almost beside themselves after these hours and hours. And he realized it's getting late, the sun is going to go down soon. So he said to them, the next town Daddy gets to, we're stopping. So don't you worry, I know it's not easy for you back there. It's been hard, it's been a long drive to get to this convention. The next town we come to, we're stopping. We find the first hotel in that town, we're all going to bath, we're all going to have a lovely meal. And so with anticipation, the children were waiting at this long drive. They came to the town, saw a sign to the hotel, and drove into the hotel grounds, the parking grounds, and as they drove in, there were just cars and cars and cars and cars. He said, goodness me, what are all these people doing in this hotel? And as they drove around in the parking place, they looked, and they suddenly realized there was a dance going on. Oh my, 
This was the dance of the year, and they arrived in the night to stay in this hotel. He said, you couldn't believe it. They were dancing as they looked into the hall. They were dancing out in the verandas. They were dancing down into the parking grounds. They were just going wild. There was no place for them all inside. They were just dancing. The drinking was going on. And he despaired. And he said, no, I can't. I can't stay here. I'm not staying here tonight. We won't sleep. I refuse to stay. We'll go and try and find another place. So he turned the car wheel to turn around and try and get out of the big parking place. And as he turned to drive out, his little girl said, why, Daddy? Why are you going? Please don't go. So he looked at her through the mirror and he said, We can't stay here tonight. The children are the devil. They're the devil's children. And so they dragged him out and looked in the rearview mirror. He saw a little girl looking longingly back at the dance. And he heard her say, Oh, I wish I was a child of the devil. Oh. Now you've got to forgive that little girl. She'd be embarrassed. To know that I told this story, she grew up to be a woman of God. But that little girl, in ignorance, in ignorance, looked back longingly to where the children of the devil were. Do you mind if I ask you this question again? I want every one of you, please, to answer God utterly sincerely. Is the world still in your heart. Is the world still in your heart? My brother Dudley is three years older than me. He's also a preacher. Dudley came to God before me. He wasn't married. He had this lovely girl, Anne. And the two of them came to Christ through one of the most godly men. Well, let me put it this way. I would say the holiest man of God I ever met in my life as the man instrumental in leading my brother to Christ. Mr. Will McFarlane came to our country in the 60s, preached in the old Presbyterian church in Boxburg, and the movement of God moved in that town that has never been seen in its history through this man of God. Amazingly, it is the young people who flocked to God in their crowd, seeking God night after night. And it was holy man of God who would have no compromise in his preaching or in his life. Oh, he was holy. He was the only man I ever stood with that I trembled in his presence. No other man ever did that to me. I shook as I looked at him. And I realized how holy and God could make a man. Will MacFarland had led Dudley to God, kneeled down with him put his arm around him and cried out to God with Dudley to be saved. Dudley, my brother, was mightily saved. Mr. Moore MacFarlane and his wife left the country. And then a few months later they were passing through South Africa and on their flight they stayed one or two nights in Johannesburg before they went on to Zimbabwe, which was Rhodesia those days. And he was staying in a home and Dudley and Anne heard I knew the people of the home that he heard that the man who led him to Christ, Will McFarland, was passing through our country. And Dudley said, I've got to see him. I want to see him. Well, he was leaving the next day, so Dudley had to see him that night. But Dudley said, well, you're going to find it very difficult to come tonight because we've gone to a dance. We booked for this dance long ago, months and months ago. There's something arranged long ago. We can't get out of it. Well, this was the only time you can see him, Dudley, is tonight. If you want to see him, I've got to see him. So they went to Will McFarland on the way to the dance. Now, if you knew Will McFarland, you would know that is the most outrageous thing that's ever been thought of, going on the way to the dance to Will McFarland. Well, Dudley and Anne arrived, and they explained to him why they couldn't wait, but they just wanted to see him, and wanted to pray, and to pray for them. And so he prayed for them, and off they went. Got in the car, drove, and Dudley said, as he was driving to this dance, first time they were going to a dance since they were saved, Dudley said Anne and him didn't speak. There was a silence in the car. And he drove slower and slower as they got closer to the dance, where all their friends had arranged to meet them. They got out the car, not speaking, they went into the dance, sat down at the table with all their friends, and suddenly, as they all sat there, this one fellow, close friend of Dudley through the years, started telling jokes. And Dudley said, Stop, please. Please just stop right there. He says, why? 
Why? Before Dudley could answer, another fellow came and said to Anne, I want to dance with you. Come. And Dudley said, Stop. I know you. Sorry. You're not dancing with Anne. I said, Why? What's wrong with you? Suddenly a man comes with a drink. Dudley's sitting there. No, we, do, we don't drink. We don't drink anymore. Sorry. I'm so sorry we don't drink anymore. Why? We're Christians now. We've become Christians. And I don't know why I came here tonight. I didn't know until now that I shouldn't have come. Please forgive us. For we can never come here again. We can never touch drink again. We never listen to a dirty joke again. And I'll never let you dance with them again. He got out, got in the car, drove back to where my father. And they opened the door. Mr. McFarlane said, Oh, Dudley, we knew you'd come back. <laughs> when you left, we all got on our knees and we all cried, God, show him. <laughs> we knew you'd come back. And Dudley said, But, sir, I never ever heard from one person in my life that it's wrong to dance. I never heard from one person in my life that's wrong to go to the dance floor. I never heard from a minister, no Christian ever told me. Why didn't you tell me? Why didn't you tell me not to go? Mr. McFarlane said, Oh, Dudley, I didn't want to tell you because I wanted God to tell you. You see, if I told you, then you would stop going to the dance because of me, but I'm not always with you. But I wanted God to tell you who was always with you. And I knew he would. I knew he would. Can I ask every one of you sitting here very, very, very carefully now, very care every single person, is the world crucified? Do you know what that means? Unto you. Are you crucified unto the world? Or is the world still in your heart? Is the world still in your heart? Will you please answer God, sir? Will you answer God now? Please. Before we go any further. He's waiting for your voice. My mother was the last one to come to God in our home. My father was gloriously saved. Never ever saw such a transformation in my entire life as my father's transformation. My brother was gloriously saved. Oh, and I was saved. The three of us are blazed for God and here was mommy. The only one in the whole home still unsaved. That was quite a predicament in our home. There's mommy not knowing what to say in the conversations. Well, we were doing everything to try and get her saved. She knew it. One night, one night, my mommy said she'd come to a meeting because it was three houses away. It was a little cottage meeting where there was a preacher going to be preaching, Christians that arranged that they'd give this little Bible study, come sermon time of prayer, so they invited us and we knew it was a godly person preaching, so I said, Mommy, please come. It's just three houses away. Come. So I said, all right, I'll come to your meeting, please. So we sat there, if ever I heard a sermon, it was that night, oh my. We were thrilled. We got home. I couldn't wait to get in the kitchen since a boy, to this day, when Mommy and I are together, we get in the kitchen. We used to like to talk in the kitchen, the two of us. We got home, got in the kitchen, I looked at my mommy and I said, what did you think? Did you enjoy that meeting, mommy? And my mother said, no. No, I don't think I'd ever like to go back in that home or that Bible study again in my life. Thank you, dear. I said, why? She said, my boy, the lady whose home we went to, obviously that's always where the Christians hold their meetings in this town. Why is it that in the mornings when I go by bus to avoid the traffic sometimes, 
Why is it that that lady sits in the bus with bloodred lips and blue and purple and short dress, all dressed to kill? How is it she's sitting there tonight, no makeup? Long dress, you know, maid. You're plain Jane. He's, if that's what becoming a Christian is going to make me, I don't want it. If I have to dress differently to what I dress when I'm not with Christians, to be acceptable with Christians, I don't want that. Thank you. Yes. Tell me, just by the way you dress, no woman here, but just by the way you dress when you're not with Christians, is there something? Is the world still in your heart? I don't believe in preaching and outward things, you know. My wife said something to me. She educates me daily sometimes. <laughs> My wife is a wisdom I will never ever attain. I've given up thinking I can. My wife said to me concerning the Alfred thing, she said, Keith, it's best you don't talk about these things, you just live it. And she said, uh, you'll find everybody sees, every woman in the whole room will see if you dress differently and it'll speak to their hearts. You must look beautiful. You mustn't look as separated as you can if you're ugly. You know, I saw something after that. I don't know how many homes I've been into where my wife sat, not a word, and the paper phoned me later or contacted me later and said, you have cost me a fortune, Mr. Daniel, bringing your wife in my home. When she walked out, my children went and burned all their clothes. Not a word. I believe my wife's right. So you've got to forgive me tonight saying this, but I wonder if the time hasn't come in the church if you would forgive a poor preacher like me if I dared to ask you, by the way you dress when you're not with Is the world still in your heart? Are you crucified unto the world? Is the world crucified unto you? Or is the world still in your heart? I'm going to preach some things that you don't pray, dare preach on these days, you know. And you've got to forgive me, but God taught me something a while back when I trembled. And I said, Lord, the doors are going to close if I preach this. Please don't ask me to preach in this particular church this message. And instead of the doors closing, God showed me something. He gave me a revelation. Not one church has ever closed its doors in this world to my ministry. Not one church. My wife tried to estimate. She said every meeting opens another 60 doors, it seems. So God honors you if you're willing to preach things you and I are scared to preach anymore. Did you know that? People want a standard again. And the devil tells us we win the world by being like the world. And that's why we've lost the world. Is the world still in your heart? Oh my. I was in a town where God moved in a peculiar way. I could tell you things of that town. Oh my. Some of the towns we went to, every single person in the entire town came to the meetings. There wasn't a soul that didn't come. The whole town turned to God. I wish I could say that at every town. But God can come. I found the answer is prayer. Desperate prayer. Where there's no desperation for God to come, nothing happens. But I've never been to the town where there are people desperate of God, but the town doesn't turn to God. And many times, a number of times, the entire time. God can come, He will come to your country when you get desperate. I was in this particular town, God was doing a very precious thing. We were all down before God in our faces for what He was doing. I said one night something I don't normally say. I mentioned about the television. Now, I didn't say to the people, get the television out of your home. I just said, listen, 
Can I ask you sincerely, every one of you, no matter who you are, even if you're a preacher in this whole in this church, I don't want any one of you to be bypassed. Do you give God the time you should for that box in your house? Has that kept you from the time you should and God would have expected you to spend with the word of God that would have made you holy? Do you put it off when no one's watching? Or are you not strong enough? And therefore, because of that box, you are totally backslidden. No other reason. That box in the home is the cause of your... Because you're not strong enough. You're watching something only the devil's children could enjoy. So you're standing there with the enemies of God, what they enjoy. Well, I went on to other things. The next day, a day or two later, a holiness preacher. I would be scared to say his name because he's known, I tell you. He called me to his home, to his wife and him. He said, Keith, we sold the tellers. We didn't sell it. I won't tell you what they did to it. Goodness me. I said, why? He said, we got rid of the TV. I said, I didn't, I didn't preach that. I didn't tell you or mean for you to go now do that. What I meant for you was to search your heart and say, are you strong enough to put it off? Are you compromising in time and losing all the time you should be gaining with the word of God and you're losing it all? He was strong enough. He said, but we're not strong enough. He said, maybe you are, Keith, but I'm not and I'm never going to be. And so my wife and I came home last night, we looked at each other and we confessed. We are totally backslidden. Not a little bit. There's nothing left because of that box. We had to make a choice to be honest. Maybe many preachers will never ever be honest. And they'll stay backslidden, and they'll stay preaching, and they know they've lost everything that's real because of that box. I want to get back to God. And you may be strong enough, Keith, but I'm not. We sat, we listened at first. We listened and we thought, oh, no, no, no. What's coming? No. Why do they do these things? But we didn't put it off. And so we got conditioned and soon no seeing we were shocked that we were sitting and looking at it. Until we found ourselves looking at everything. The child of God would be astonished if we were looking at it. We used to pray in the nights, have devotions together in the nights, year after year after year after year. The moment came, please, we spent five minutes with God can find that some nights because of that box. We can't get away from it. I'm too weak to survive with that in my home. So I don't know about others who call me a fanatic but so that I got the right to stay on in the ministry. I want to get right with God and I can't do that in my house. Even if the world says I've gone too far, I've got to. Otherwise I say back soon to the day I die. Oh, oh, oh. I know a man, a preacher, who wouldn't have a TV in his home. He's a God, a God that is an extremist, and his parents, his mother said, you're not doing this to the children. They're going to go to other homes. They can't get the legitimate, good educational things there. We're buying you a TV. Biggest screen there is. So it arrived. And he says, here it is. Here they come. Removals brought this big, the shop brought this big thing. And on the box, as they carried it in, was written these words, We bring the world into your home. <laughs> and he said, No. Get it out. Take it back. Oh. Now I want to be careful here, even though you all seem to be agreeing with me. I want to be careful here. I don't want you to say that I have said, that Keith Daniel said, that having a television in the home is out. I don't want any one of you to ever say that of me, even if you'd like me to say that. I just don't want to give you that right, okay? I don't want any one of you to say ever once in your life, Keith Daniel said, it's sin to have a television in your home. Get it out of your home. Because I didn't say that tonight. Many church doors will close immediately on me if you say Keith Daniel said that. No matter what you know, I believe. 
Not... <laughs> but I'd like to say this. I'd like to have the right to say this, though you will never ever be able to say those words of me if you at all have any integrity. I'd like to have the right to say this to you. By what you know and God knows and the devil knows you watch, sir, on the television, is the world still in your heart. Will you please answer God? When no one's watching, what you will not stop is the world just by what you watch in your heart. Are you crucified under the world? Is the world crucified unto you or is the world still in your heart? I have three children. I've spoken of them already. No, my eldest and Roy, my middle, they sing. Now, they were very loved in our country. No, but the little boy suddenly had this piercing voice, thrilling. It was alarming. And this little child was suddenly put into the province's children's choir. Of the, and there he was. He was very musical in the symphony choir with his violin, the symphony orchestra. Very musical. Loves the piano. Loves music. No, does. And suddenly Roy got to the age of love and suddenly he got strength in his voice and this thrill just came through the house and suddenly they were singing together and when I was singing the old hymns of the faith these two went over and started blending harmony and I realized there was something precious here so I said, boys, you want to sing in the meeting? Could we, Daddy? They were small, by the way. <laughs> okay, so we prayed and they sang and I noticed something. The people were stunned and there was just tears coming down their faces and these boys saw it all. They sensed it. So suddenly, without my knowing what to do, because I didn't know it was going to happen, the doors just opened. The boys were preaching in the con singing at the convention, singing in the churches, singing when I was going to preach, singing there where they were practicing. They had something to give. Practicing away all the time. Beauty, the beauty of these two boys harmonizing. One day I watched them in the house as they were practicing, and something came in my heart of a terrible, terrible fear. And I said, boys, Will you please forgive me for what I'm going to say, but I have to say this to you. Entertainment in the pulpit of God is sin. There is no place in the church for entertainment. You go to the stage. You go to the theatre if you want the applause of man, get out of the pulpit. Boys, if you go into the pulpit ever again in your life without getting on your knees and seeking God by the blood of Christ to give you the right to stand in front of the church of Jesus Christ and minister, by the blood to be anointed and filled with the Holy Spirit and anointed and guided by God to what he would have you and allow you to bring into the pulpit of God that would not be entertaining but would meet a heart and draw a heart and not draw people to you but to God. Not draw people's attention to you but to God. Unless you pray from your heart for God to prepare you, for God to anoint you, for God to guide you as to what to even sing. Boys, if you don't see God in desperation from your heart and utter sincerity, then you're sinning. You're sinning. If you ever go in the pulpit again, there's too much entertainment in the pulpit, boys. I don't want you to be entertainers in the house of God. You should see my boys pray now. You should see them pray now before they sing. I was in a country, I won't tell you what country, where this particular town, God just came. Every single church combined in the end. Cancelled all their meetings, it was just this united coming and seeking God. And night after night, suddenly, 
before I ended preaching sometimes, before I could even close, every single soul was on their face before God sobbing. God came. God came. Before I preached night after night, there was very little before the sermon. There was something of a sanctified atmosphere there. They had people singing. Godly people. But as the crowd swelled and swelled and swelled, suddenly one night it was announced that some man who was famous in this country, utterly famous in secular singing and he had professed to be a Christian and we also sang in the churches. So he came and suddenly I sensed there was something different in the front of this church, something almost like a little stage set up to accommodate this famous singer. He stood, oh, the music. Suddenly, the way he sang, oh, do you know what happened? You're not going to believe this, most of you. It has happened. The whole hall stood and cried, Stop! <laughs> Never saw that before. We're sick of entertainment! We must not let this atmosphere be taken away by entertainment in the world. One man stood and said, there has never been a sense of God in the history of this town like there is now. We must not allow anything to break this atmosphere. No entertainers, please. No entertainers. We're finished with that in this town. We're had enough of it. Oh, oh, the ministers all gathered afterwards, though every single minister in the town gathered, weeping. What are we to do? You know, they decided no more singing. Unless, unless every minister listens to the whole song and approves it, and the person is about to sing, otherwise not again, for the next few nights. I was stunned. I trembled. I trembled. You know when revival comes? You won't allow them in the pulpit! Don't say you had revival meetings, sir. Just look at the entertainer you enjoyed before. That wasn't revival. When God comes, there's no entertainment in the pulpit. Duncan Campbell, in the Hebrides revival, Duncan Campbell said, there's no such a thing as entertainment in the pulpit of God. You stand there as a sinner, sinning, if you dare to stand in the pulpit. And you are there as an entertainer, and you know it. You're there to get the applause of man. You're sinning. I was in a town where a very, very famous preacher, a very, very famous singer, terribly sorry, very famous singer, was in the meeting. And after I preached, I preached about what happened in this particular town where all the people screamed, stop. I preached and told what I told my two boys and now they started to pray and there was no place for entertainment in the pulpit. And this fellow, this famous singer, because he's a Christian, turned to Christianity, makes records and discs all over, he is so well known, television, he's known, let me tell you. Well, afterwards, they introduced me to him, and suddenly everybody realized I, I was the only one in the church that didn't know him. They said, don't you know who he is? I said, well, I don't know, I, I really don't know, because I don't listen to these things, I don't know what's going on. I'm terribly sorry that I don't know who you are. Uh, he wasn't hurt, you know, he just looked at me, with respect, funny enough. And this dear man said, Mr. Daniel, I want to tell you that God brought me here tonight. I want to tell you that I'm singing in the pulpits of the great conventions across this country since I've been saved. I have been singing. I've been the one called out there. I'm in all the churches, the biggest churches. I sing. But as I listen to you tonight, I realize uh, all I'm doing is entertaining. I just change platforms into the church. All I'm doing, all I'm be doing is wanting the applause of men. That's all I'm doing in the pulpit, and sir, I'm so scared. I sat there trembling as I heard you. I want you to pray for me, but I'll pray the prayer your boys, you told your boys to pray before they dare stand in the pulpit again. 
There's something about me, sir. In what I choose by God's guidance, what to sing, and the way I sing it will not bring the applause of men, but men broken before God. I hear your applause. I don't believe that I'm pointing to you and that you're guilty of this. Don't let me get you all mixed up now. There's such a thing as absolute spontaneous joy and thrill and an amen from your heart and even from your hands that is not sin. We know that. Don't get me wrong. Please don't. But if you're guilty... Don't doubt it, sir. You need to hear it. Mary Morrison, Mary Hecken, she's coming to speak at the ladies' prayer advance. What a woman of God you have come in here to your country. I'd start praying if I was you. What a woman of God you've invited. Her life. Oh my. Mary Morrison, let me tell you something about her. She was on the hit parade of Britain in the 1950s. Did you know that about her? Very few people know this anymore because she doesn't talk about these things. Mary Morrison, record sold above all other entertainers at that particular time. She was about to become on the brink of becoming a world famous star. It was a matter of months. Some say even weeks. She would have just had to go that little bit further. She was the star stepping on to the fame of the world. Everyone knew it. To this day, one of her records is still a signature tune on the BBC. They couldn't change that song. Mary Morrison, by her parents and family to come back, Is there, but out on the hills, men who didn't even know what was going down in the cities and the towns were on their faces weeping. They didn't know why they were under desperate conviction of sin. The whole land turned to God. And God came in a Bible. That's your Bible, sir. Not our organizing, not our great preaching. God. God out of the building where there's no sermon, where no one knows what's conviction of sin. Do you know that that is revival? We pray for nothing less, because anything less is not revival. It's just a stirring up and an emotional time and perhaps blessing to a certain extent. But until God comes, you haven't tasted revival. And when God comes, nothing can stop him. Nothing can stop him. She walked back into this. Her whole family saved. Every friend she has in the whole world saved. Born again. The crowds running down the streets right through the night. Right through the night. Five in the morning. She's still trying to keep up unsaved. Right through the night to the next meeting, to the next town. Thousands, thousands marching over the hills to the next town. And all the Christians singing the praises of God. Oh, oh, revival. Give us revival. Mary Morrison arrives back, gets mightily saved to one sentence that Duncan Campbell preached the first time she heard him. Mary, the Master calleth thee. Oh, my. She was gloriously saved. Gloriously saved. But now she had to leave the revival because of commitments with the recording agency and commitments to sing. She went back. She said, I can't sing these songs anymore. I'm only going to sing for Jesus now. You see, when I stood up and sang one night in the revival, and if you sing in the revival, you don't sing unless you mean it. You keep quiet. Because there's such a fear of God. You don't say a word that isn't to the heart of God from your heart. When I stood and sang that one night, take my voice and let me sing always, only for my King. I meant it. I meant it. I will never sing again for anyone else but my King. Oh, the shock. 
the threats, because of the contracts. I don't care what you do to me. I don't care what you do to me. Do it. I will never sing for the world again. She never did to this day, you know. She only sang for Jesus. She sang in prime ministers' homes, in presidents' homes. Did you know that about Mary Morrison? She led two prime ministers to God. Mary Morrison was standing now in the recording studio when one day one of the most famous singers in the world walked in. You all know him. It was quite a few years ago now. He also professed to be saved. And this agent said, this is Mary Morrison, and she said who this man was. He's got this idea, don't let the devil have all the good music. Well, Mary Morrison was introduced to this man, and this is him, and this is Mary Morrison, and he said, the greatest disappointment in the world. She won't sing unless she sings for Jesus. She's gone so overboard, a fanatical, that you can only sing for God now. She won't sing for the world. So this man stood there who also sings for Jesus, but also sings for the world. And they both just stood there shaking their heads in contempt at her. She said, it so hurt her. She doesn't know why. She started to cry. She walked out. She stood in the street and she looked up to heaven and said, oh God. It doesn't matter if I'm a disappointment to the world. So long as I'm not a disappointment to thee. That's Mary Morrison. You say she goes too far, sir. Have you led a prime minister to God? You say she goes too far, sir. Has God ever anointed your life as he has her life? In my country, talk of Mary Morrison... Seldom you'll be in a place silence doesn't fall in the room. She's so loved. She's so holy. You ever do that for your life, sir? If she's gone too far, have you ever gone far enough? Oh, I know it's hurting. And I know a lot of you are probably wondering where is he going to end? Is the world still in your heart? I was once asked to preach at a youth rally and thousands and thousands and thousands of youth from across the land came. Busloads, busloads, busloads streaming into this convention. And I was asked to preach in this last meeting, this great gathering, where there was going to be different gospel groups singing. I never quite heard that before in my life, but gospel singing, gospel groups and I was asked to come across the land to preach, to bring the closing word to all these gatherings, the largest, I think, youth group they ever had in the history of that country. Well, I sat there and onto this big stage and these thousands on all the lawns up on the hill, all gathered. And there were the loudspeakers. There they started to sing. You know, after about 20 minutes, I started to cry. Have you seen a preacher cry? You know, I cried. I sat there. I tried to hide it. I thought, God... If I close my eyes, it just sounds like I was in the nightclubs when I was in the nightclubs, in the disco. There's no difference. Every now and again I hear the word Jesus in the singing, but I can't even discern most of us what they're saying. And I just began to cry and said, Lord, what's going on here? What am I doing here? I didn't know this was going to be the case here. They went on and on and on, group after group after group coming. Some of them, you wouldn't believe what they looked like. I just looked and I both just went, hid my face and cried that this person was standing up now to tell us about Jesus from the pulpit and the singing. Eventually, after a good, 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 good long time, let me tell you, they came to me and they said, listen, it's gone longer than we thought. There's still two more groups and we can't say no to them. And the buses, all the drivers know there's a certain time they have to leave. They, they have to leave at that time. You'll have to cut the message short. I know how much time you want to give me. The most we can give is ten minutes. I said, no. I said, no, sir. I have listened for two hours to this trash. 
and not one person in this whole gathering could have been possibly saved through one thing that happened here tonight. Look me in the eyes and tell me they could have. Their blood is on your hands. You stand there and tell me after all this rubbish that there's still time for the last two that you don't want to miss. There's no time for the word of God. Sir, I've known you for a while. When did you backslide? <laughs> so much that you can look at me and say, this is the way you want to win the world. But you bury the word of God. You must be backslid. What's happened to you, sir? I will not preach for ten minutes, even if the bus is drive off. I'm going to preach the time you gave me. They all stood there, sorry. I'll take all the time you need, don't worry. <laughs> so I stood. I stood and I preached. I wept through that sermon. I sobbed at certain times. But if you saw what God did that night, that those young people would have never seen in their lives had we buried the word of God for entertainment. I want to ask you from my heart, every one of you, when it comes to methods, to methods of how to reach the youth, to win the world, do you want to be like the world to win the world? Is that really how you think you are going to win them, sir? When is someone going to stand up and tell you again, you're wrong? When are you going to allow a preacher, sir? When will you allow a preacher to stand up and tell you we're wrong? We've missed the mark. You're wrong. You'll never win the world by being like the world. You'll never win the world by entertaining like the world. And I learned something. It took a while to learn, but I learned something. There's not a youth, not a youth alive that doesn't know the difference deep in his heart. When he first time in his life he hears someone singing who's filled with God the Holy Ghost and is not entertaining, there's not a youth that doesn't know this is from God and not all that. Amen. Don't even think you are confusing them. You're losing them because they don't know. But when the nine comes, when they hear someone, they'll know you failed. This is what they should have heard. In their hearts they'll know it. Not one youth in this earth they won't realize it the day God puts in front of them someone who's not an entertainer in the pulpit of God. How is the world still in your heart even the way you drive them in the world? It's written across you. I'm going to speak now about Billy Graham. Be careful now. Billy Graham, and I'm talking about many, many years ago now when God took him to London. No matter what you say about him, accept this plea from God tonight. I know what people are saying everywhere. When Billy Graham was young, and God moved in London in 1953, it was an amazing movement of God. People were singing in the streets and they Thousands, believe it or not. Thousands. London never ever knew that in its history. So many had turned to Christ in the great Billy Graham crusade, 53. Next time he came, he was known now. He was known. That made the world know there was a Billy Graham. What happened in London? Next time he came, within days, he was in Buckingham Palace with a young queen of England and a young Prince Philip and Billy Graham was talking to the Queen and began to sense certain things about her and he said, Your Majesty, have you ever given your life to Jesus Christ to save you? The Queen said these words, When I was 
14 years of age. Queen Mary, my grandmother, who was a born-again Christian, asked me the same question. And I knelt with her at that age and asked Christ to come in my heart. Were you really saved? Do you read the Bible so soon? My grandmother made me vow that I would never read less than four chapters a day for the rest of my life. And you read four chapters every day of your life, Your Majesty? Yes. This morning, I read four chapters of the Bible. It's not easy. It's not easy. But I believe that I am saved. Suddenly Prince Philip stood up and said, uh, is it wrong? Is it sin? Is it wrong for me to play sport on a Sunday? And he likes his polo, horse polo. And he looked over and said, certain people think I'm wrong. And Billy Graham said, no. It's not sin. It's not wrong for you to play sport on a Sunday. It's not wrong for any unsaved person <laughs> to play sport on Sunday. Even if you don't play sport on Sunday, you're still going to go to hell. Unless you're saved. What is happening on Sundays You can feel the pulse of the church. How desperately far we are from reality and the Bible. You may say he's a legalistic fellow, isn't he? Let me tell you something. Now, this is going to shock you. Charles Finney, D.L. Moody, John Wesley, Duncan Campbell, name them, every man you have God ever used in the world's greatest revivals. George Whitfield. Every single one, read Charles Finney's sermons, lectures on revival, you'll be stunned what he says. All of them said the same thing. The first thing that they noticed after God came to a land, God came to a town, God came in the Bible, was the Christians. Sunday was a holy day. Now, you praying for revival, that's what's going to happen. If God answers your prayers in your life, it's going to be a holy day. No desecration. You won't look upon people like me as lawish or legalistic or too extreme, too far. Can't enjoy life. God made the day for us. It was made for us, not for anything else. Very well. Well, then the Holy Spirit convicted nation upon nation upon nation through every major revival the world has ever known in its history on this one issue. God convicted them wrongly, according to you. When God comes in revival, and we're back to where we ought to be as a church. And by the way, the revival is when a church gets right with God. When the people of God get so right with God that the lost are brought within days, within months, and their millions, they see God through our lives. That's revival. Amen. Awakening resulting from revival. When God's people make God's day even a holy day. A holy day. Oh my. With all the sport going on, Sunday sport, the major professional events. I used to remember the days when Christians in our country would listen to the news in the television and then the sports section came off. Oh, sport was not allowed in their hearts. Slowly I began to go back to the same homes up the years and suddenly I was conscious they're listening to the sport now. Couldn't miss what happened. What happened. Every major thing ends on the triumph. Instead of climax on Sunday, what are we going to do? How are we going to miss 
So they miss church for one of the great tournaments now in our church. Golf, tennis, rugby, cricket. Thank God for those in our country even now who will not play on a Sunday. So they missed on the Springbok side. Whatever happened to the honor we gave men, whatever happened to the esteem we gave men when that film, I haven't seen it, my one boy saw it in the church, told me about it, a film called Chariots of Fire. It reminded the world that God honors them that honor him. When a man who was the best in the world, no doubt of that, trained his whole being, his whole lifeless moment, this point, in that which he was excelling in, though he was a godly man. He excelled and was representing his country, and here going off to the country, suddenly, there, he's told he's to run on a Sunday. No. No. Your event that you've trained your whole life for at this moment, Sunday. No. Do you know there was such a predicament, I believe, that the king, he wasn't quite king then, he had to abdicate afterwards, but the king and the prime minister of England marched into him, and the king ordered him. You will run for your country. You will not let us down. You cannot do this to us. No. I am sorry. I will not. The Prime Minister jumped up, I believe, and swore. I don't mean it was in the film, but I believe he swore. He cursed. He said, You would disobey your king? And this man said, I will disobey my king if he tells me to disobey the king of kings. <laughs> so with disdain from his king, his Prime Minister... And many, many other people who couldn't believe what they heard is not going to run in that event. Somehow, God arranged it, by the way, to just to tell the world, just to show the world how he'll honor you if you go too far. This dear man was switching something he hadn't trained for. It was all worked out somehow that someone who was trained for that particular event could switch without any difficulty. But this particular event that he wasn't geared for, he hadn't perfected, he was told to change to there, so he's standing there now, his chance of the Olympics of winning gold, his thing that he's, now an event he hasn't trained for, a length, a distance, so he stands there, and someone in the crowd, as he's standing there, ready, on the lanes, the guns standing, ready to go, someone, ha, ah, somehow, God did this, by the way, a little note rushed off, across on the Olympic track, put into his hands, and he says, God will do this. You don't get away with this in the Olympic Games, you know, somebody running on the track. He looked at it and there was a piece of paper, God honors them that honor him. And he ran and he staggered the world as he flew past the this record that had been dreamed. Oh, how we esteemed him when he heard of that film and that God reminded the world afresh of how he'd honored him. How we all esteemed him. Tell me, what's happened to the world? What's happened to the church that suddenly even that we've buried in our argument that oh, come on now, we've gone too far. Where have we forgotten those who got honored? Where have we all forgotten the esteem we've had for men who would lose titles, who would lose everything they worked for in life to achieve rather than deny God? Where have we forgotten to esteem them and to copy them? To hold in reverence men God so honored. Sabbath has been so desecrated by God's people. No wonder the world has no restraint or respect for that day anymore. What the world does on God's day, is it in your heart? Is it in your heart, child of God? Are you crucified unto the world? Is the world crucified unto you? Is all you glory in? All you glory in, sir, the cross. By whom? The cross of Jesus Christ. By whom? The world is crucified unto me. And I to the world. Has not the time come for us, as Romans 12 says, to lay ourselves as a living sacrifice. Be not conformed to the world. Be transformed by the renewing of your minds. Tell me, does God need to do that to you desperately tonight? 
You need to get back. You need to get back in this world that, God, when I look at the world and the compromise in the church, when I look, Lord, at what's going on, no one seems to want to hold a standard anymore. You're legalistic, you've gone too far. You're just lawish. But God, when I look at how far we've gone, God, I just need some stopping place that I don't go any further with it, no matter what the church is doing. I need, Lord, as never before in life, when I look at what this world is doing, I need very carefully at this point in my life to ask thee very earnestly to keep the world crucified unto me and the world and I unto the world. I need thee, God, desperately tonight. Desperately, because I'm never ever going to hear this thing said again in my life. I guarantee you that. I guarantee you that. And before I go back out there, I need to say to God from the depth of my soul, God, at this point of life, I desperately need thee. I desperately need thee. Whatever it takes to make it that my life is crucified to the end unto the world and the world unto me. But the world will be crucified unto me when they look at me. And when I look at them, dead. I need it, God, before I take another step because I might never, ever, 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 ever again have a place where I can stop in the holy presence of God on everything everything that I've heard tonight everything everything I need to stop and have it written across me in bold letters in this with the world I needed a fresh God I may have failed I may have compromised I may have been affected but I stop and I say God I come afresh desperately Write these words across my life by the blood of Christ and the Holy Ghost. And let everyone in the world see it no matter what it costs, but this rather than that. And where they're heading. I'm crucified with Christ. Crucified. Those of you that know that before you go back out in that world, God wanted you to seek him now in desperation that this will be written across your flesh by the Holy Ghost in your heart and to your being. Let him do it. I want you to stand those who desperately need God. Desperately as you've looked at your life. As you've looked at how you've been affected. And you say, not any further, God. I go back now. I go back to where I was. Maybe for the first time you're seeking God. God's watching every one of you. Come, every one of you, bow in silence now, after silence for one moment. And in the prayer I pray, you pray in your heart, please, not with your lips. Father, I pray for revival. Maybe I'm the one who would be the fastest to hate it when it comes. For the demand on every level it will make where I've compromised. God, please. Things have gone so far out there and I haven't been affected, Lord. I want thy forgiveness. Tonight, I want to sober up and stay sober no matter how drunk the world gets. No matter how drunk the church gets. Allowing the world to come in by becoming like the world. God, I don't want to become like the world. Not on any issue. Not on anything. I don't want the world to be in my heart, God. Please, I want to be crucified unto the world. And the world crucified unto me. I don't want the world in my heart. From this day to the day I die by what I would dare to watch on that box in my own by what I would dare to do on God's day by what I would dare to do to win the youth by what I dare to do in the name of entertainment in the church 
what I would dare to do, Lord, by the places I would go, or the company I would keep, the way I dress. I don't want to live in legalism. I don't want to live in bondage, lawlessness. That's ugly, Lord. But I want spontaneously, without any rigid disciplines and hard, hard taskmasters, I want to live out of love for Christ spontaneously, a standard, a standard that is so high that everyone in this world would know I am crucified unto the world. I don't want to look down at any soul as far in the world as they are. I don't want any soul to feel I look down at them. I want them to look at me and see in me more love than they've seen in the eyes, in the words, than any other soul they know on the earth. Love them through me. I don't want to look in judgment. I don't want to speak in judgment not once in my life. What I heard tonight, Lord, can seldom be said straight. My life needs to just win by the way I dress, by the way I live, by the way I preach. My God, I want thee to so work it that written across my life without a word I say. The world will see finish with the world, but I won't turn them away. Don't let anything be in me, not one bit of lawlessness that's ugly. Let Christ-likeness be seen. And Lord, thou art holy. Be ye holy, for I am holy. God, let me be as holy as thou art holy, in obedience to thy commandment. I could never be as beautiful ultimately as Christ. I long to be as holy as it's possible for thee to make a man. And I ask thee to do it by the blood of Christ tonight. I ask thee to come, Lord, and take my heart and my being. God, they were filled with the Spirit, their hearts been cleansed by faith. By faith in the blood, cleanse my heart and fill me now. Take control of every faculty of my being, for I lay my life as a living sacrifice, and I do not want to be conformed to the world anymore. I want to be transformed this moment by the renewing of my mind. And I renew it. I allow thee by the Holy Ghost through this message tonight, through these illustrations, through these people that I've heard of one after the other, right down to that man that wouldn't do sport on Sunday. Though his king looked at him in disdain. I'm sure his king never respected a man in the world more than that. I'm sure of that, Lord. Even at that moment he might have looked in disdain. God, help us. Help us. Help us. Help us to be so crucified to the world and the world unto us, but to be the instrument that can win the world every step we take. That what they see in us, they long for. Bring the world back to God to us, Lord to us being Christ-like and holy without any compromise because when we compromise we lose the right to win the world. Take us now. Hold us close to the heart of God. Every step we take till the day we die don't ever let us compromise with the world again. In Jesus Christ's name. Amen. Can we all stand? Listen, listen carefully before I leave this pulpit. You dare not be offended with this man. If you knew my heart, I don't know how desperate you are for revival. I am desperate. I am desperate. Do you know why? And that's why I dare to preach these things. Because if revival doesn't come, in a short, short while, you will weep for your country, America. Don't forget these words now. Get desperate. Within a very short time, there's not one man in this building that will not weep for America when you see what comes.
God make us desperate for revival. Yeah. Because when we get desperate, God will rend the heavens and heal the land. Yeah. God will give you another Finney, another Moody, 